while our director of technology is getting my, my mind on the screen, just a couple of comments. One is, Amy, may I call the distinguished professor Amy? <laughs> Talked about everyone knowing about PCK. A couple of years ago, my wife Judy and I were taking a little walk in Shanghai, very close to East China Normal University where we were doing some teaching. And a group of small children saw me. And they weren't used to someone with a white beard walking along the streets of Shanghai. And they began pointing at me and laughing and saying, KFC, KFC. <laughs> Well, uh, I want you to think of today's talk as the first small step in the development of my new conception of KFC, which we shall call Knowledge for Curriculum. Uh, Dean Goodwin whom I for years have been calling Lynn, but uh, I think your hair looks fine, but look what the weather has done to mine. <laughs> also, when they told me that we would be celebrating a 100th birthday, my first response was, I'm old, but I'm not that old. Uh, but I'm glad to see that it's the centennial of something else. One of my privileges as president of the Carnegie Foundation, a role in which I came to appreciate the profound importance, thank you dear friends, of enlightened philanthropy in moving ahead work of significance. Uh, I had the privilege during my presidency of celebrating the 100th birthday of the Carnegie Foundation a foundation that he established in 1905. And we celebrated in 2005, and since he's very famous all over the world for libraries, because he got very little formal education, he was educated by going to and then creating libraries. Uh, I don't think I'll be there, but I think the 100th anniversary of your foundation will be as significant <coughs> as any other 100th anniversary. And may your grandchildren and great-grandchildren celebrate it with joy. The notion of maestro, Amy, is a very lovely notion. I thank you very much for it. But I would remind you that at least in my world, the word maestro is most usually assigned to the conductor of a symphony orchestra. And I will attest to the fact that I feel like a maestro in that sense, because without the contributions, the gifts, the expertise, the passion of many, many collaborating musicians, all maestros are silent. They are mute. They are without voice. And I see Andy and Posse nodding as well. Those of us who are scholars are only scholars because our work rests on the work of others. That's why scholars use footnotes. And traditionally, you know, footnotes were at the bottom of the page before we got APA style and put them at the end. They belong at the bottom because when the footnotes are at the bottom, it says to everyone, you see my work up here? It rests on the foundation of those who came before us. Important lessons for us who do scholarship. All right, like the dean, I was <coughs> taken by the notion of reimagining. What do you mean reimagine? You imagine. You imagine. What could reimagine mean? 
And then I began thinking of all the words that we create by adding a re to them. We talk about telling and retelling. Is there any greater pleasure than that of a young child who asks you to retell the same story to her again and again and again? God forbid you change a small detail. But if you do, you say, oh, but listen to this, the joy they get from hearing it in a different way. And of course, the two-year-old child who hears that story is very different than the same child at the age of five during that story. But my favorite is counting and recounting. We talk about counting things, putting numbers on them, and often that's what we need to get something published. But just the counting is meaningless until we recount, until we transform number into story, into narrative, because in moving to recounting, we add meaning to mere quantity. There is no quantitative, qualitative difference. Number must become a quality. And of course, we search for things all the time. I search for my glasses at least four times a day, even <laughs> though I forget that they're attached. We search for our keys, but research is a different process. It elevates search into a different kind of experience, and I won't go into that much. But I'd like to think about reimagining as imagining from many different angles. How do you get an image? So let me tell you a little story. A few years ago, I was in Beijing, and I took a walk with Professor Min Wai Fang. Anyone here know Min Wai Fang from Beijing University? A few of you know him. His first class at Stanford University was one that I taught. In fact, it was the morning of October 1, Chinese National Day, and I began the class by congratulating him on his National Day. It was his first day in class at Stanford. I was teaching a course in qualitative research methods with Mildred McLaughlin and Shirley Bryce Heath, the three of us teaching together. <coughs> Maybe 10 years after he left Stanford, Min was the provost, or I forget which very important role he had at Beijing University. I was visiting, he took me for a walk, and it was a walk around this lake. And the lake is known as Lake Waimin. <laughs> it is a lake with no name. And he took me for a walk and he said, he said, Lee, do you see anything interesting about the shape of this lake? I shrugged my shoulders and said, yeah, pretty shape. And what are you going to say? You know, someone shows you their baby. What do you think of my baby? <laughs> I've never seen a more beautiful baby. <laughs> and usually if they're very small, their hair is much like mine. <laughs> In any event, he said, notice the shape of this lake. He said, from any vantage point on the shores of the lake, you can see a great deal. But there is no one place on the shore from which you can see the entire lake. The entire lake is not visible to someone standing in one spot, no matter how good their eyes are, and no matter how motivated they are, to see everything. You can only see the entire lake from multiple perspectives, from moving, either moving from one point to another, which is excellent exercise, or by having collaborators. Having collaborators who are standing at different points in the lake, they each develop their own image and then you come together and you create a shared image. And he said, I hope that that is the conception of collaborative, co-constructed understanding, knowledge, imagination 
that this university, his own at the time, can develop and ultimately can be the hallmark of all universities. And that in some ways is a leitmotif for my comments today. Because I'm suggesting that reimagination means imagination seen from three different perspectives. And the three I'd like to talk about today are from the inside. What kind of imagination can we exercise as members of the teaching and teacher education community? It's a community I have felt a member of since at least 1963 when, of course, I was only four years old. Uh, but anyway, from the inside, a second perspective from the community of professions. And I will say more about this in a moment. But I believe that teaching should never be thought about in isolation, in its own silo. The world is served by many professions without which societies would be endangered. Medicine and nursing protect society from illness, law from injustice, engineering from falling apart, and education from ignorance, from a lack of understanding of their role in society. And the clergy, they support our spirit, our sense of the divine and of the ineffable. And yet taken all together, social work, physical therapy, dentistry, all the professions, accounting, I don't know when your taxes are due, but ours are due in about a month. All of these work together to provide service. And I want to think about the second vantage point as the vantage point of the professions I left one out because I don't have time to talk about it today. But there's also a profession called the academic profession. Those who profess as professors and teachers, uh, that too is part of the community of professions. And finally, I want to end with a few comments, a few ideas, which may be the only fairly new idea in this talk. The rest is retelling. Uh, which is the special role that education, that teaching can play in helping deal with the failures of other professions to do their work as well as they could. So let's begin. From the inside. I'll go through this quickly because we're all insiders here. If there's somebody who is not an insider, so for example, if there's a dentist who has wandered in here, uh, well, Susan hangs out with dentists. Where are you, Susan? It's, uh, there you are. Um, if the dentist would please identify him or herself at the end of my lecture, because I'm sure there is someone here with a toothache. Uh, as insiders, we sort of know what some of the areas that are very hot areas of development are in our field is insiders. I am, I must say, flattered and in some ways humbled by seeing how much work is going on here in Hong Kong, in China, around the world, where they take this small, incomplete, flawed idea of pedagogical content knowledge that I developed 30 years ago and have fertilized it, used it, watered it. And I sit as the footnote at the bottom of an incredible page of critical work in teacher education and curriculum development and teacher professional development. And what's interesting for me is some of the variations that have occurred by us as insiders, and I'll mention a few of them. One. My teacher, one of my teachers, Joseph Schwab, talked so much about understanding the complexity of the structures of subject matters. 
that my colleagues and I and those who have followed us have emphasized that nothing is more complex than the structures of content for teaching. What is the content of history? In con particular cultures, as narrated and framed, I mean, what is the history of my country, the United States of America? Andy, you were once a Brit. <laughs> Have you ever read the history of the American Revolution written in an American textbook and written in a British textbook? How about the American Civil War written from the North or from the South? We thought that war was over 150 years ago. We're finding out that it isn't, but that's another story. Uh, I mean, just think of all, from perspective, what about the same history as framed for five-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 15-year-olds, and PhD candidates in history? So the notion of content knowledge for teaching, that in and of itself is a fascinating area of scholarship and of experimentation. My former student, Deborah Ball, is doing wonderful work on that in mathematics at the University of Michigan. And Lynn, don't lose heart. She's doing it again after retiring from the deanship. I'm told that there's life after deanships. And there's also life on other planets. So I'm not sure if these are related or not. You have to go to another planet, uh, Steve. Uh, or PCK, pedagogical content knowledge. I no longer think of it that way. I think of it as P, C to the nth power K. Yes, content is very important. But I've begun to understand, it only has taken 30 years, the importance of pedagogical context knowledge, pedagogical community knowledge pedagogical cultural knowledge, and we run out of C's and have to talk about language and children. The message of PCK is about content and the importance of content, but it's also about content as necessary but not at all sufficient. As Amy said in my comparison to neurosurgeons, I actually ended that that paper by saying to those neurosurgeons, friends, nowhere is medicine as complex as an average day in the classroom of a fourth grade teacher than perhaps in an emergency room during an earthquake when many people are streaming in, all of them wanting attention immediately. The surgeons weren't very happy with my comments. <laughs> Their spouses were delighted. And that, that was an era when the neurosurgeons were mainly men, by the way. That's no longer the case, as I think you all know. But in those days, one of the ways in which neurosurgeons demonstrated their intelligence was by marrying teachers. It generally worked to keep them in medical school, but that's another. <laughs> but notion inside our field, there's so much exciting stuff going on that only we know about. High leverage practices. The notion that there are, even though every day in teaching is different, there are certain things that happen routinely. They're never exactly the same but still they, they, they reflect a certain similarity of process, of strategy, of approach. And it's crazy not to give our students opportunities to practice and practice and watch videos of and practice and study those practices and how to do them better. In teaching mathematics, we discovered, we, my colleague Gail Einhardt at Pittsburgh with James Greeno years ago discovered that one of the places math teachers fell apart or excelled was at the beginning of every class when students brought in 
their problem sets in mathematics they had done as homework the night before, it was very important to review that for the teacher to get a sense of what the students did and didn't understand, for the students to understand what they understood and didn't understand. I mean, it was very, very critical. You know what was fascinating? Some teachers did the entire homework check and review in seven or eight minutes at the beginning of class and did it very effectively. And then went on to new things. Other teachers, often with the same number of years of experience, took half an hour. They hadn't learned to manage and conduct that high leverage practice. And they had many fewer hours of instruction available. And no one had ever seen that and said, let's give, you know, a former president of Teachers College Columbia, where Lynn Goodwin did her internship before taking her more important work, um, made the observation that people make fun of people learning to teach because they learn to do some routine tasks, like how to write on a blackboard in a way that makes sense to students. And they say, ah, teaching. Simple, technical, mindless work. And he said, you know what's interesting is they don't say the same thing about how many hours surgeons spend learning to sew. We do a lot of sewing as teachers, and it's damn important work. And that should be part of, and but we're working on it now with high leverage practices and trying to identify what they are and how to give people opportunities to do them. We're getting terrific with performance assessments, with better ways of assessing and evaluating the quality of teaching and teachers using simulations, using very in, inventive portfolio assessments, which I had the great pleasure and privilege of helping to pioneer in the work that we did in creating a national board for teaching in America. These are assessments that people can collaborate on and still be assessed. I still remember when we developed our first portfolio assessment, one of my colleagues said, you can't use a portfolio. I said, why not? He said, teachers cheat. I said to him, what do you mean teachers cheat? He kind of looked around as if we were spies, and he said, they actually help each other with their portfolios. <laughs> they look at videos together, and they critique each other, and they, and I said, isn't that, so, isn't that what we're trying? You said, right? I see one of our colleagues in the audience saying, of course. And so we solved that problem by requiring that teachers work together on their portfolios, which also demonstrated their ability to collaborate. I said to this fellow, I said, do you have a PhD? He said, of course. I said, did you have an advisor for your PhD? He said, naturally. He named some famous educational measurement specialist. I said, was your advisor really engaged in your work? I mean, did he give you a lot of feedback and assistance? He said, of course, he was indispensable. I said, so it's not really your PhD, is it? <laughs> Collaboration is fine as long as it's us, not them. And too often, teachers were the them. Performance assessment is an area as insiders that we are moving ahead on. Introducing notions of culture and cultural responsibility and social justice into our idea of teaching excellence. That's something where teaching has been the pioneer. And I've had only one criticism of my colleagues who have introduced notions of social justice. And that is that they have so emphasized social justice that they ignore the importance of content. And I keep on saying justice will only be achieved if we are much more responsibly effective with all children and helping them achieve the deep knowledge, understanding, and skill that we expect for our society. Justice does not occur by simply talking about it 
or giving people an easier ride. But this is our idea as educators. And again and again, I must remind us that all the work I mentioned is work that has been inspired by research. Not only by search, but by research. Yes, by experience, but by transforming experience into learning scholarship. And scholarship whose value is not measured by the impact factor of its peer-reviewed journal, but by its accessibility to other educators, its utility, and its power in transforming the lives of educators and their students. One of the most important things that happened to me was leaving my neighborhood. And that was five years after beginning at Michigan State, I was invited to spend half my time inventing a school of medicine. Because, as the first dean said to me, you're a psychologist who studies how people solve problems. Of course, I was studying how teachers solve problems. But I was prepared to agree that teachers were people. And he said, we are training physicians to solve problems. And we don't know a damn thing about problem solving. Can you come over and be 50% professor of medicine and medical education? Sure. I mean, it sounded like fun. And I then spent much of the next decade doing research on how physicians think and solve problems, designing with my colleagues in medicine a curriculum a new curriculum that started with problems, not disciplines. Susan, before McMaster, problem-based focal problems curriculum, it was revolutionary. And actually teaching medical students. I, a psychologist, a teacher, teacher educator, I was teaching medical students. They didn't let me do it alone. I did it with a physiologist and with a physician. But they didn't let them do it alone either. I learned so much from spending my life. Very often, half my week would be in medicine, half my week in education. I'd be teaching teachers and teaching future physicians at the same time. And I don't know how many of you have gone to other countries and seen classrooms that you should be very familiar with, but they're different. And when you have that experience, you now go back and look at your familiar with a new lens. That's what my colleague Fred Erickson taught me to call making the familiar strange. There's something powerful about seeing the other professions around you. One of the tragedies is this campus is filled with other professional schools. And I think only a tiny number of you have ever taken the time to go and watch teaching, participate in teaching, in dentistry, in medicine, in nursing, in engineering, in physical therapy, and law. Oh, I love law. Fascinating. You want them on your side, by the way. Um, and when I became president of the Carnegie Foundation, the two first studies that we then did for the next 10 years was a study of education of the professions, but we went out and in depth studied these professions and what we call their signature pedagogies, the forms of teaching that were unique to those professions, as well as the ways they were similar, that kind of deep structure, as the linguists would say. And so here again, we were inspired by our neighbors, but we were enlightened by comparative research. We didn't just hang out. We studied, we talked, we wrote. And the important thing about writing, my friends, is if you don't publish, your ideas will perish. I know all about promotion and tenure. I, I know all about that. I chaired that committee at Stanford for the university. So it's, I can tell you stories about that as well, but I won't today. The point is that not only will your ideas perish if you don't write, 
If you don't write, other people can't attack your ideas, criticize them, tear them apart, and make them better, or kill them before they damage other people. I'm very serious. Going public with your ideas is an indispensable obligation of the scholar, of the educator, and one of the great tragedies is some of the most wise people in the world are classroom teachers who learn so much. Now, often they haven't done research, so we have to help them develop those skills. But that, that wisdom does not get out, the wisdom of practice, because we don't see them as part of the scholarly community. What a waste. What a sin. So we are enlightened by comparative research. But the thing I'd like to end my talk with and really emphasize is that in this community of interdependent professions that serves humanity, there are two problems that I want to highlight. One is, even though we work together to serve the same people. So if you have an aging parent about my age, you know it's likely that that person is served by physicians and nurses, social workers, members of the clergy, physical therapists, lawyers. There are now elder courts in which the problems of the old are the major focus of those courts because they're different than they are of other people. Engineering, as the population ages, they are redesigning kitchens, bathrooms, stairways, walkways, sidewalks. All this, they're serving the same population. And you don't have to be 80 to need that kind of service. You can use a little bit when you're 35. I think I remember that. But the point is, these professions are like members of the same orchestra. Can you imagine an orchestra in which the people in the first violin section never even talk to the people in the second violins or the violas? Or maybe the strings do, but what about the horns and the percussion? What about members of a football team who never talk to each other, even though they're expected to be passing the ball back and forth? That's how the professions are. Now, in many of the professions, we as educators actually have joined their ranks. Susan, you're in the health sciences as well as in education. I was professor of education and medical education. When we did our studies of medical schools, nearly every medical school we studied had a division of medical education. You have one at Hong Kong University. I looked at its website. It looks very exciting. Uh, I know the Chinese University of Hong Kong has such a division. Most medical schools have something like that. And you can see the results of 50 years of research in education applied in new courses in doctor-patient interaction, in physical examination. There are other fields where you wouldn't know education exists in the States. Law. I don't know of a single law school that has an education division. Engineering is actually beginning to come up. Nursing, way ahead of the game. But that's, we're familiar with that. That's we as educators who are joining with our colleagues in these other fields. I'm working with the surgery department at Stanford right now, which just created a new position in surgery called vice chair of the Department of Surgery for education. All the candidates were senior surgeons who also had a master's degree in health sciences education. It's a new world. But I want to introduce a different notion. And it's a notion that I'm excited about. Back in my first paper on pedagogical content knowledge, I quoted the Greek philosopher Aristotle in talking about the difference between somebody who is merely an expert 
and who is, he calls him an artist, I would call that person a professional. So let me, with your permission, replace the word that Aristotle uses with the word professional. I'm also sufficiently gender sensitive that I won't use he all the time. We regard master craftsmen as superior, namely professionals as superior, not merely because they have a grasp of theory and know the reasons for acting as they do. Broadly speaking, what distinguishes a person who knows from the ignorant person is an ability to teach. And this is why we hold that what I would call wisdom and not experience as the character of genuine knowledge, epistemi. That, that professionals can teach others and those that have merely picked up some skill cannot. That's what Aristotle said, and I think he's absolutely right, and I would go further. To profess any profession requires that you not only solve the problems, but that you can teach those that you serve so they don't need you all the time. A professional educator. Let's look at the world around us. Have you gone to a lawyer recently? Judy and I go to the lawyer about once a year, fix our will and things like that, and he explains our taxes and all this stuff. We go out, and you know, we're reasonably well educated between the two of us. She's a good deal smarter than I am, but on the whole, we can handle it. And we look at each other, did you understand what he just said? No, but I assume you did. No. <laughs> no. Lawyers who have to teach us how to manage our own affairs are lousy at explaining, at teaching things. You go to the physician, and the physician tries to explain, I hope the physician tries to explain to you why you're feeling the pain you're feeling. The really bad physicians don't even explain. They write a prescription in such a way. Physicians are actually terrible at teaching. They've never been trained. Nobody taught them to teach. And the irony is the word doctor is the Greek word for teacher. Doctor, doctrine, it's a teacher. A doctor was somebody who could not only heal you, he could explain why they did what they did and what you could do about it. Most of our illnesses today don't require fancy diagnosis. If you've got type 2 diabetes, or if you've got Alzheimer's, or if you've got a whole bunch of diseases, the diagnosis is easy. You have to learn to manage your life. Management is education. But the doctors have never been taught to teach. And we can go on with engineers, with clergy. The professions that I absolve from this accusation, that I find are really good, at teaching, and they get taught to teach, they get practice teaching, are nursing, physical therapy, very important again as our population ages, social work. Although social work still needs a lot more help because they do so much teaching. So my proposal in my reimagining is that I know we have too much in our curriculum already and I'm going to add more. So I apologize. I would do it anyway. That every decent teacher education program have a chunk of that program in which future teachers spend time with people in other professions and begin to see that teaching is not something that just goes on in a classroom with little kids. It's going on in the offices of lawyers, in the in, in, in physicians' offices. It's going on everywhere. And they, as teachers, know a great deal more about that aspect of the work than the lawyers, the doctors, and the social workers. And they have something to contribute. In the community of professionals, we teachers ought to be helping our colleagues in other professions teach better, help them develop better techniques. I've been given a minute, I just want you to know I'm not going to respect that. I'm going to use about five. 
And, you know, I mean, first of all, you know those five minutes? Amy took them. <laughs> or the dean took them. I don't know. I knew I had them before I began. And my wallet's still here, but my time's gone. All right. The point is that this is a, a new role for teachers. I think, first of all, over the course of a 40-year career as a teacher, how much more interesting our lives as teachers would be if we spent some of it, if we didn't spend all 40 years doing the same thing, but if we could offer the genius of our work to others, you could say, well, what kinds of things does a teacher know? Well, my former student, Pam Grossman, did, her, did a book called The Making of a Teacher. You know the big difference between those who were trained as teachers and those who were not was? The first question somebody trained as a teacher asks is, what's already in the heads of those I'm trying to teach? What do they already know? What don't they know? What's their experience such that I can create analogies and examples and metaphors that will connect to their experience? That's we, we learn that as teachers. It becomes second nature to us. We don't even realize we know it. That's how well we know it. These other professions don't ask that. They give the same explanation of the liver disease you've got, no matter who you are. They even tell you about T cells and God knows. They don't ask, what does my client already know? I was teaching a class in a business school once, and I asked the students, write a little autobiography. And I found, of the 24 students in my class, this was in Israel, and I was teaching in a business school, long story, don't ask, it was a nonprofit management, anyway. When I started giving them, talking about teamwork and collaboration, I remembered that about five of the students were volleyball players. So I talked about collaboration from the perspective of how a volleyball team, somebody has to set, somebody spikes, somebody. And they came to me after and they said, that was so clear. How did you know to do that? I said, I didn't know. You told me your story when I asked you to just write a couple of pages about who you were. I'm a teacher. That's what teachers do. We teach human beings with different experience and background, and we connect to them. And you've got to try to do it even if you've got 400 people in your So we have so much to contribute. And if we do that sort of thing, first of all, we'll become better teachers. I became a much better teacher educator every time I came back from being a medical educator. I just, I, I, I understood things about diagnostic reasoning, about triage. And how do you deal when you've got more people to deal with in the, in the emergency? I just got smarter about my own work. I helped them out enormously. And ultimately, if we can pull this off, we, uh, we help society more. So please forgive me, mea culpa. I am now about to add a new acronym. I'm going to suggest that we add to the, to the the body of knowledge of teaching, PPK. Pedagogical professional. That teachers understand what members of other professions do that requires the kind of pedagogical understanding that we teachers have. Let's teach our teachers that. Let's have them develop it in their internships, in their collaborations. And there is a principle that I'd like to introduce, too. No one is allowed to introduce any new acronym unless they subtract three others. <laughs> and I am open to your nomination of other acronyms in our field, which has more acronyms than gardens have weeds, uh, for three subtractions. But nobody can subtract PPK for at least another year. And so we return to another body of water, Lake My Wing. Hawaii Ming, the lake without a name, is, is, is gorgeous, it's beautiful. It's too small to reflect how big, complex, and messy, and beautiful our world is as educators. And so I use Hong Kong Harbor instead. Water flows in, water flows out. 
There are periodic monsoons. I was once here for one rated 10. Oh, but the eye is beautiful, isn't it? The eye. Uh, there's a lot of pollution, <laughs> and it comes from all kinds of places. Usually policymakers, but that's another question. That's another. But the point is that we can't see everything from any one place. We have to be in different places working together. It's a, it's a useful metaphor. It's also useful to remember the wisdom of Ecclesiastes in the, in the Bible. All the rivers run to the sea, and the sea is never full. And people say, well, that's pessimistic. He's saying, ah, all our money is, all our time is wasted. The rivers run to the sea, and the sea never fills up. And my answer is, no. The purpose of rivers isn't to fill up the sea. You got the purpose wrong. The purpose of the rivers running is to enrich the banks of the river, to make the fishing and the growing and the, and the enjoyment a greater source of growth and pleasure. It isn't to fill up the sea. Those of us in ed reform who think, oh, we failed because we didn't solve all the problems of education with one reform, got it wrong. The purpose was not to fill the sea or to reform, reform. Just notice what that re sounds like. To reform education with one brilliant idea. No, reform is the process of running through and enriching the banks and it's never over. So I'm going to finally respect my colleagues' time and end with an observation that I learned from a professor of church history at Howard University when my colleagues and I were studying the education of ministers and priests and rabbis. And I said, to him, is it frustrating to teach history to the future Pastors, clergymen, they're not interested in history, they're interested in how to give a better sermon and stuff like that. He said, well, I try to teach them that there are certain personal, personal attributes that are necessary as habits if you're going to grow in your field. And I suggest that we need these four as well, you and I especially if we are to do not only search, but research. Reimagining and making that wisdom available. The first is honesty. I don't care how strong your ideology is, your values, your passion for justice and equity and women and men and whomever, children, you can't lie. If you gather certain kinds of information, and if it isn't information you like, tough. Dishonesty. In our world, we, the reason we have footnotes at the bottom of the page is not only that our work depends on what's at the bottom, it's we rely on it. If one of us publishes something, somebody else reads it, and they don't say, I wonder if he's lying. Honesty is very it's important to ourselves. We can't be dishonest to ourselves. Which leads to humility. If you're really honest, you gotta be humble. Because you very quickly discover that you can't know it all, you can't do it all, and half of what you're sure you know, you're gonna find ain't so a little while later. And that's okay. That's okay. If you never make a mistake, you're not doing your job. Humility. Very important. But you put together honesty and humility, and we will all be in a psychiatrist's office being treated for depression. I mean, it's very depressing. So the third feature that my colleague in history suggested was humor. You've got to be able to laugh at yourself. You've got to be able to not take everything so seriously that you forget that life, it's as if life was designed 
to keep us off balance. And we've got to learn to laugh together. Laughing together at one another, making fun. It's the essence of friendship, it's the es and it's the prerequisite to durable wisdom. But now when you add that humor, you can become hopeless. And that we as educators cannot afford to be. So underlying it all, there's got to be a sense of hope. A kind of optimism that persists even when the honest collection of data leaves us recognizing that our last reform didn't change the world. When our humility helps us recognize that, no, we, uh, we have good reason to feel humble <laughs> and laugh. But hope is something we cannot afford to give up. And since my colleague who held up the sign and said five minutes about 12 minutes ago, <laughs> he too deserves to have some feelings of hope. <laughs> I don't know your name, but I will find out because you have a thankless task. <laughs> I will fulfill his hopes and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you.